Well, good evening, everybody. Hope this Wednesday finds you in a good spot, that you're enjoying your day, the beauty that God has given us. As we come to our Wednesday night Bible study, we'll be in the book of Job once again tonight. So uh, let's take a few moments and give you a moment to kind of get started, recognize that we're here. I invite you to find a copy of God's Word. Sit down with yourself, your family, and with a copy of the Word, maybe a pen and paper to take some notes on, and we will get started in our study in the book of Job. We have been for now quite a few weeks uh, doing kind of a survey of this book, and we have reached Job chapter 38, which will be in tonight. And uh, this evening is when Job is finally introduced face-to-face, -face, so to speak, if you will, with, with God himself. So grab a Bible, pen and paper, and let's uh, introduce ourselves a little bit this evening to the book of Job. Let's begin with some prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for tonight and for the opportunity to take a few moments to look in your word. And uh, perhaps uh, tonight, more than any other time in the moment of, or in the book of Job, to be introduced to who you are, to your character, to see how you spoke with him and recorded those words for us. Lord, teach us tonight through your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So the last few weeks we have been reviewing and going through all the different uh, speeches that Job's friends have made and his responses back to them. And last week we saw the introduction of a fourth gentleman we had not met before by the name of Elihu. Elihu was younger than the other three, and he had a slightly different take on things. Now, much of what Elihu had to say last week we saw in the mid-30s in those chapters was similar to what the other three friends of Job had said, but he did have a, a couple of different things for us to, to kind of consider last week. Uh, one of those was this, that he tried to point Job's direction, uh, Job's thoughts, if you will, less about Job himself and even less about Job's circumstances and more onto uh, God himself. So he spent some time trying to, draw Job, trying to draw Job's attention away from his circumstances and to God. Never, never a bad thing. And then the very end of chapter 37, as Elihu wrapped up his last speech, he introduced this picture of a storm, God in the storm. And we looked at that a little bit last week and, and took note of how a storm can have a couple of different aspects to it. One would be that from one perspective, a storm can do a lot of damage. It can cause lightning, it can burn things down, it can blow things over, it can wash things away. On the other hand, uh, storms are often what is necessary for the earth to be refreshed and to be renewed and for life to be uh, given what it needs to move forward for the next few years. So storms can both destroy and give life. And that uh, storm analogy, that storm picture is how Elihu ended his last speech, and it's how God introduces himself to Job. So Job chapter 38, let's begin reading in verse 1. The Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind, so that's out of a storm, and said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now gird up your loins like a man, and I will ask you, and you instruct me. So God answers Job, and Job uh, is going to be uh, he's getting ready to go to school, if you will. And so in the same way that Elihu kind of ended his speech, this idea of a storm, and by the way, it was also a, a windstorm that destroyed Job's family, it is also in the storm, or the whirlwind, if you will, that God shows up. And we see this a couple of different times throughout Scripture. It happens for Ezekiel. Uh, that God is perceived as coming on the thunder and the wind, the lightning, and we see even kind of glimpses of that in Revelation. So God in the storm is not necessarily a new thing. We see that here in Job. And uh, God says, okay, Job, that's, you, you have some questions for me. You have been making some charges. Let's go ahead and talk. And in chapter 38, God is going to begin to take Job through a, a tour, if you will, of natural phenomena and question Job about his understanding of these things. So let's, let's look at some of these things briefly. Chapter uh, 38, verse 4. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who set its measurements? 
since you know, or who stretched the line on it? What were its base on what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Or who had closed the sea with doors when bursting forth it went out from its womb? When I made a cloud its garment and thick darkness its swaddling clothes. Look at verse 12. Have you ever in your life commanded the morning and caused the dawn to know its place, that it might take hold of the ends of the earth and the wicked be shaken out of it? Look at verse 16. Have you entered into the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been revealed to you or have you seen the gates of deep darkness? Have you understood the expanse of the earth? Tell me if you know all this. Where is the way to the dwelling of light and darkness? Where is its place that you may take it to its territory and that you may discern the paths to its home? Verse 25, who has cleft a channel for the flood or a way for the thunderbolt to bring rain on the land without people on a desert without a man in it to satisfy the waste of desolate land and to make the seeds of grass to sprout? Verse 31, can you bind the chains of the Pleiades or loosen the cords of Orion? Can you lead forth a constellation in its season and guide the bear with her satellites? Do you know the ordinances of the heavens or fix their rule over the earth? Can you lift up your voice to the clouds so that an abundance of water will cover you? Can you send forth lightnings so that they may go and say to you, here we are? Who has put wisdom in the innermost being or given understanding to the mind who can count the clouds by wisdom or tip the water jars of the heavens when the dust hardens into a mass and the clouds stick together we're going to pause there for a moment there in verse 38 and so what we have here is is job being introduced if you will to a whole new world and that may for some of you bring a song i you almost kind of have the the, the clip here of, a, of aladdin and uh, jasmine on the magic carpet and uh, all see all these wonders of the world for the first time there is a sense that god is taking job on a remarkable ride here and he's showing him everything that could possibly be him be shown he's showing him from the depths of the of the oceans to the gates of death itself to uh, the rising of the dawn he's taking him to the constellations and the stars to the ocean shores and to the depths of the ground itself upon which the earth is founded he takes them through all these things he takes them through the birth of darkness and light he has he's taking job through all these remarkable things in the natural world oceans foundations dawn dusk the abyss the light and dark snow and uh, fall uh, snow and hail which we kind of skip past rain stars lightning now, this is not the only time, by the way, in Scripture that we are invited to look at creation and catch a glimpse of or begin to understand a little bit about who God is through his created order. This happens elsewhere in Scripture, too. In fact, Romans chapter 1, uh, verse 20, says this. Since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood through what has been made. Now, in the context of Romans chapter 1, he's talking about how humanity as a whole, as the human race, does not have an excuse to say it doesn't know about who God is. Because God has said, I am completely knowable. You can understand the basics of who I am by doing nothing other than looking at the natural world around you. So whether we are considering the oceans or whether we are considering the storms of the sky, whether we're looking at the stars, whether we're looking at the foundations of the earth itself, whether we're looking at dawn and light and darkness or even death, he says these things all point us to a basic understanding of the existence and nature of God. That's a remarkable thing. Now, it doesn't mean that we can learn everything we need to know about God and salvation through watching the sunrise or the sunset, but it does mean that the universe that we live in is evidence and is proof of the nature of who God is, and that we cannot go before God one day, as we all will, and we cannot say before him, I have no idea you were here, 
And God's saying, I left evidence of myself everywhere, not just that I exist, but even a bit about what I am like. The, the natural world that we live in is there is enough there to give us, at the very least, an indication, clues, and hints that there is more to know. It should instill within us a, a curiosity and a desire to know more about the architect, the creator, the maker of all that surrounds us. And on top of that, the Bible does say we will be held accountable for ignoring that evidence if we choose to do so. So this is God's taking Job through this incredible journey of evidence about what God is doing. Now, not only does he do that in chapter 8 or chapter 38, if you will, with uh, kind of the natural world, the phenomena, the, uh, the dawn and sunlight and stars and all those types of things. In chapter 39, he's going to take it at the end of chapter 38 into 39. He's going to add another layer and he's going to start looking at the animal kingdom. So let's begin with the end of chapter 38, verse 39. Can you hunt the prey for the lion or satisfy the appetite of the young, of the young lions? Verse 41, who prepares for the ravens its nourishment? Chapter 39, verse 1. Do you know the time the mountain goats give birth? Do you observe the calving of the deer? Can you count the months they fulfill, or do you know the time they give birth? Verse 5. Who sent out the wild donkey free? And who loosed the bonds of the swift donkey? To whom I gave the wilderness for a home and the salt land for his dwelling place. He scorns the tumult of the city, the shoutings of the driver. He does not hear. Verse 9. Will the wild ox consent to serve you, or will he spend the night at your manger? Verse 13, the ostrich's wings flap joyously with the pinion and plumage of love, for she abandons her eggs to the earth and warms them in the dust, and warms them in the dust, and she forgets that a foot may crush them or that a wild beast may trample them. She treats her young cruelly as if they were not hers, though her labor be in vain, she's unconcerned, because God has made her forget wisdom and has not given her a share of understanding. Verse 19, do you give the horse his might, or do you clothe the neck with his, do you, clothe, do you clothe his neck with a mane? Do you make him leap like a locust? His majestic snorting is terrible. He paws in the valley, he rejoices in his strength. He goes out to meet the weapons. He laughs at fear and is not dismayed. He does not turn back from the sword. Verse 26, is it by your understanding that the hawk soars, stretching his wings toward the south. Is it at your command that the eagle mounts up and makes his nest on high? And it goes on for a little bit more. There in chapter 39, God is moving from drawing Job's attention to uh, the uh, kind of the, the, the things like the stars and the skies and the oceans to actual animals. And he's drawing our attention to a couple of different things here. Now, most of the animals referred here to, all except the horse, are wild animals. They are relatively what we think of as untamable, uh, whether it be the mountain goats or the lions or this wild ox he refers to is not what you might think of as a tame, it's a tame ox. It's, it's a wild animal that can't be uh, tamed and was never used in domestic uh, chores. Uh, whether it's the hawk or uh, these other animals, they are by and large wild animals. And God says to them, I want you to look at these things. And I want you to learn about my wisdom and my nature through observing what I'm going to show you about these animals or about what you already can observe about these animals. And so he begins to do that. Now, again, uh, just as uh, this isn't the first time or the only time that God uses the natural world to give us a glimpse of his character, this isn't the first time God uses animals to do that exact same exact same thing. We go all the way back to Genesis chapter 2 and the creation of mankind, the creation of the human race. And on day uh, day 6, God has created Adam. He's created all the other animals, and God parades all the animals by Adam. And he does name them, but what God's really trying to do is to illustrate to Adam something that Adam's going to need, and that is Adam's need for a partner. And so from the very beginning, God uses the natural world and uses the animal kingdom to illustrate some truths about us and about who he is. Let me also take you to Luke chapter 2, or I'm sorry, Luke chapter 12, the Gospel of Luke in the New Testament. So in the Gospel of Luke, 
Jesus himself is going to share with us some illustrations or some things to be learned, if you will, from the animal kingdom. And in Luke chapter 2, I'm sorry, Luke chapter 12, uh, beginning in verse uh, 22, Jesus says this to his disciples, I say to you, do not worry about your life as to what you will eat or nor for your body as to what you'll put on, for life is more than food and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap. They have no storerooms, no barns, and yet God feeds them. How much more valuable are you than the birds? And which of you by worrying can add a single hour to his lifespan? If then you cannot do a very little thing, why do you worry about other matters? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, but I tell you, not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass in the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, how much more will he clothe you? You men of little faith, do not seek what you will eat and what you will drink, and do not keep worrying. For all the things, all these things the nations of the world eagerly seek, but your Father knows that you need these things. Seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has chosen gladly to give you the kingdom. Now, that's obviously a fantastic passage, perhaps many of us are familiar with, and probably a good word for us here in, in the month of May of 2020 a time when many of us are tempted right now to be deathly afraid of the world around us. Uh, we're worried about what we're going to eat or drink. We're worried about uh, getting sick. And I think Jesus would tell us this evening, why are you so scared? All these things rest in my hands. Yes, there are things you don't understand. Yes, there are things you perhaps don't see clearly. But why do those things scare you? You know, it's, it's amazing if when we find ourselves, maybe like Peter, when he's walking on the water, he begins by getting on that boat looking at Jesus. And then the moment he begins to look at the waves, he has not just the waves crashing over him, but he has fear crashing over him. And once that happens, he begins to sink. As long as his eyes were on Jesus, he was walking on the water. The moment he began to look at the waves and become afraid, he began to sink. It works the same way for us, whether we're in Job 40, or 39, or whether we're in Luke 12, or whether we're like Peter on the Sea of Galilee. Once we take our eyes off of the God of creation and look at the things around us, we're going to find ourselves as small creatures, if you will, afraid. And the moment we're afraid, we begin to sink, we begin to panic, and we uh, it's, it's a joyless life to be scared. That doesn't mean that we're unwise. It doesn't mean that we're not cautious. It doesn't mean that we won't use some common sense. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying to go out and, and be rash and unwise. But what I am saying is this. We should not be a people who are typified or typically who are scared. That's not of God. Um, because if we're scared, if we're afraid, if we're terrified and petrified and all those things, whether it be about what to eat or whether it be about a virus, then, this is, then we are not looking at who God is. So, this isn't the only time God uses even the, the animal kingdom, if you will, to teach a lesson. And so he takes these things, he, he gives Job a, a biology lesson, so to speak. And he says, listen, all these animals, and, and, and that's just the you know, Job, the mountain goat, the, the donkey. We're going to assume, Job, and we'll assume that we are as we are looking at this tonight, we're going to assume that we are more intelligent than these animals. We're just going to assume, I'll let you I'll let you fill in the punchline there. <laughs> We're going to assume that we have a wisdom and an intelligence and a, and a knowledge that animals don't have. And yet, whether it is the, the, the mating uh, timings and rituals of the animals, whether it's things like migratory birds and animals that go here, animals have what we sometimes use as instinct, what we call instinct. This is what part of what God's referring to here in Job chapter 39. He's referring to how all these animals, all these creatures, they know when they need to do this. They know when they need, they, they need to go there. They, need, they know when they need to go here. Uh, whether it's, he doesn't use these specific examples, but we could use them. Whether it's the salmon knowing when to migrate up the stream that they were born in, despite how does it, how does it know. Uh, whether it's 
uh, birds, whether it's penguins, whether it's uh, butterflies like the monarch butterfly, all these animals have instinct. And now what is instinct? I, I looked this up, by the way, today. What is an instinct? An instinct is simply this, an innate, typically fixed pattern of behavior in animals in response to their environment. It's something that's innate, something inside them. Animals don't go to school to learn when to migrate. Animals don't go to school uh, to learn how to go from here to there. They just kind of have an innate instinct. And so God's telling Job, listen, look at all these animals that you would see as not wise. And yet they have an instinct. They have something in them that guides them, that they know what to do, when to do, how to do. Job explained that. Where does that come from? Well, of course, the answer there, of course, is implied that it is God who has given even the dumb wild animals, so to speak, that instinct that allows them to survive. In other words, their provision, they are provided for, their lives, their life cycles are governed by and, and, uh, and put in place by the wisdom of God. And just like Jesus would say to us in Luke chapter 12, if God's giving them what they need to survive, how much more is he going to give you what you need to survive? If the wild flowers trust God, so to speak, how come we can't? That is the question. Now, there are a couple of interesting little things in here in the middle of all this. I want to look at two things here in Job 39. One is he talks about the ostrich. It's almost a comical uh, description of the ostrich. And he kind of he says there in verse 17 of chapter 39 that the ostrich doesn't have any wisdom that God's removed their wisdom or understanding. Now that seems kind of a cruel joke, doesn't it? I don't know if the ostrich really is that dumb of an animal or not, but this is what Job 39, 17 says. And we might look at that and go, well, that's not fair that God would make the ostrich maybe a little dumber than the other animals. But again, who's the one that made it? Who's the one that designed it? Who's the one that has put it for whatever purpose he has Who's the one that put it there and designed it? Even if it's just for a laugh. <laughs> I know when I, I uh, it's been over 30 years now, I had the chance to spend some time in Australia. And most of us know Australia is full of animals that don't look like or aren't found anywhere else on the planet, whether it's a kangaroo or whether it's a, a duck-billed platypus. There are some odd-looking creatures down there. Some of them kind of make you laugh to look at them. Some of us kind of make people look to laugh to look at us too. So some of us know what that looks like. Even if God just has a sense of humor and we see his joy in some of what he makes, even if that's the only purpose, who are we to question the wisdom of God, whether it's the making of an ostrich or a platypus? Um, I don't know that Job knew probably what a platypus was. So what to make out of all this? Job has had a couple of questions repeatedly that he's asked throughout these first 30-some-odd uh, chapters. One is, why is God doing this to me? I'm innocent. And is God just? He's, he's even in his more down times had the, the boldness to ask, not, not really accused, but to ask if God is really being just here and how he is treated Job, and Job has asked repeatedly in places like chapter 9, can, I, I, I want an encounter with God. I want to meet God. I want to have a conversation with God so I can ask him these questions and he can tell me what's going on. Uh, Job has essentially asked that. Now, Job, uh, he's, he's even done things, by the way, like in chapter, uh, he's even done things like wish for death a couple of times. Um, so as we go through this, as Job has sometimes wondered aloud about God's righteousness or justice or the fairness of God, as Job has even wished for death, God does not even pretend to be answering those questions here. God, when God, he's, when God does show up, he, he says nothing about any of Job's questions, at least not on the face of it. He doesn't answer Job as to why he's going through these things. He never does, as far as we know. He doesn't. Uh, defend his righteousness. He simply takes Job on a tour of the world. He even shows him the gates of hell. It's kind of interesting. 
or the gates of death. It's kind of interesting here. He said, Job, you've wished to die. Have you even been to the gates of death? Do you even know what it is you're asking? And of course, the implied answer is, of, of course not. Um, all these things are going on. So again, what's going to make out of all this? Job's friends, the biggest error they make is not that they don't have some truth, is that they think they're speaking for God, that they have a complete handle on all truth. They think they have the entire system figured out, including God himself. They said, and we've talked about this repeatedly, they believe suffering or the sin always brings suffering. Suffering is always the result of sin. Now, there's truth to that. But it doesn't always happen in the time frame that his friends are assuming. Job has disputed that, those assumptions on the grounds that he is, in fact, innocent. He hasn't done anything. And so that his suffering is not the result of sin is what Job has insisted all along. So Job is not accepting their, quote, orthodox theology, so to speak, of those around him. He's not bound by what they believe. Now, that being said, he still is kind of grounded in it because even his questions for God are, if I haven't sinned, but I'm suffering, then something must be wrong here because he's assuming that suffering is related to sin. But he recognizes that's not his situation. So that's why he questions God's justice. So there's even a little bit of that simplistic theology, even in Job's questions. He's, he's not entirely rid of all that stuff either. He's moved beyond and moved farther than his three friends have or his four friends have, but he hasn't moved completely past it. Of course, we know that suffering of Job has nothing to do with his sin. It also has nothing to do with God being unjust. So Job is further along than the rest of the people in this particular tale, but he still has a lot of learning to do. And of course, in Job chapter 38, school is in session. Job has complained and agonized in faith and sincerity. I think along these times, I think God would say that and did say that in the book of Job. But just because Job is sincere, because Job has faith, doesn't mean he has understanding. Doesn't mean he has a grasp on everything that is true. And by the way, I would take us there tonight. Um, we may be those who have trust in God, have a sincere faith in God. It doesn't mean we have all the answers. Um, one of the frustrating things about even someone in my position, and I am by no means uh, one who claims to have all the answers, but uh, someone as a pastor, someone who has studied the Word of God, someone who spent many times thinking through and praying through things, the truth is I don't have all the answers. In fact, I feel like I have fewer answers now than I did years ago. Uh, one of the things I will, I will confess is as a young man in ministry 30 years ago, I, I expected to have more knowledge than I do now. And, Interestingly enough, through the years, what I found is I, there's things I don't know, there's things I can't know, and I've become over time much more comfortable with the idea that I don't have it all known, I don't have it all figured out, and I'm not going to, and that's okay. In fact, it's, it's not just okay, it's, it's a good thing. I have limits. If I can understand everything there is to understand, then everything is not really worthy, it's not really that complicated, it's not really that big and vast. The truth is, I want to trust in one who has wisdom and understanding and power far beyond anything I can understand. If he's not that, then he's really not God. He's just a human construct. He's, a, he's, a, he's an idol. So I'm grateful for the idea that I do not understand everything, and I find actually comfort in that. And what God, what God is doing with Job is Job has asked for, he's asked some questions that he's not going to get the answers to. And where Job is erred and where Job's friends are, are making a mistake is they are mistaking that they believe they have everything figured out, that they have God in a box and they have everything, all the I's dotted, all the T's crossed, they, they've got it all put in place. And I'm here to tell us, even, in, even with the word of God that we have, and we have much more direct revelation of God in the scriptures than perhaps what Job had. But even with the full word of God from Genesis to Revelation, we do not have everything there is to know about who God is. And we need to be very careful that even as we do tell what we do know, as we share the gospel, as we share the truth of God's word, that we do not say that we have it all figured out, that there is a humility about us as the people of God. 
as, as I have seen in, in times like the, on, on this pandemic and the COVID-19, it's a little frightening at times to see believers passing things along, whether it be on social media or other formats, where they are acting as such sometimes arrogant ways as if they are the only ones that know the truth. They have it all figured out. The rest of the world uh, does not know what they're talking about. And whether it's a conspiracy theory or whether it is a spiritual matter, Christians oftentimes give the idea, whether they mean to or not, they have all the answers. If there's a people that should be aware that we don't have all the answers, it should be the people of God. In fact, what we're really doing is we should be saying, listen, we don't have all the answers, but we have a faith and a trust in one who does have all knowledge and all wisdom. That's who we are trusting in. Now, it doesn't mean that we have a blind faith, by the way. To trust in God is not a blind trust. It's not a blind faith. It's not something I do without reason. That's what blind faith is. A blind faith is means I have no reason to believe this is going to happen, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to trust anyway. We don't have a blind faith. As we've already seen demonstrated in chapter 38 and 39 and elsewhere in Scripture, nature itself, the world that we're in itself, is a massive amount of reason to trust in God. God has given us evidence of himself all over the place, even in our consciences. The Bible says, we talked about the instincts of the animals. The Bible says that we, as a human race, have consciences. Romans chapter 2, verse 14, 15, talk about how we have a conscience that in our hearts convicts us. We know instinctively what right and wrong is. And by that very fact, we're giving evidence that God exists. So even as a human race, we have instincts that prove the existence of God and the nature and character of who he is. So all these things give us evidence that God is who he says he is. And so we are without excuse. We have reason to believe. Not a 100% ironclad proof like you would have in a courtroom, for example, because there would no trust be involved then. But we do have reason to believe. Not We're not blindly believing. So as we believe, as we, as we trust the one who has wisdom and given wisdom to everything from the wild donkeys to the hawks to the ostriches, who has put in place the stars and the planets and has governed all those things. While we don't always get the answers that you and I want, we do have one who has all those answers and he is worth trusting even when we don't understand. Look briefly here at Job's response. Chapter 40, verse 3. Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I'm insignificant. What can I reply to you? I'll lay my hand on my mouth. Once I've spoken, I will not answer. Even twice, I'll add nothing more. Job knew this might be the situation in chapter 9. He refers to the point, the idea that he wants to speak to God, but knows it says in chapter 9, when I speak to him, I'm not going to be able to say anything. I'm not going to win the argument. And, of course, chapter 40, he has encountered God, and he has nothing to say. He, he doesn't recount. He, he doesn't recant. He doesn't say, "I'm still, I'm, I'm not, I'm not guilty now." He's, he's he's maintaining his innocence, but he also realizes that he has no way to converse with God. That God's on such a different plane of understanding and power that Job just doesn't have a, a leg to stand on, so, so, so to speak. That God is only really worth trusting here. He doesn't. He's not worth arguing with. He's worth trusting. And that's probably a pretty good place for us to leave off tonight. That God is a God for whom, for us, it's probably far more profitable to trust than to argue with. I right, thank you for your time with us this morning or this evening. Our plans are for Sunday morning, one more week, to have our parking lot praise and worship. I know right now the weather forecast is a little iffy, and if that changes, we'll let you know. But this coming Sunday, the 24th, I'm sorry, the 17th, uh, will be our last parking lot praise and worship service. And on the 24th, a week and a half from now, we will resume, at least that's the plans, we'll resume in-person worship services here in the sanctuary with some, uh, with some guidelines and with some safeguards in place. Those details are on our website and they're on our Facebook page as well. So I encourage you, if you haven't taken a look at those, to do so. I'm so grateful, grateful for your time with, us, uh, with, uh, with me tonight. I hope you have been reminded that we have a God really worth trusting. Have a blessed night. We'll talk to you soon.